So we'll continue. Uh, let's just collapse this, make it a bit more free space and make it look neater. We're still looking at the get matrices part. And now everything becomes quite a lot simpler. Um, actually, before we continue, let's just plot it. So why don't we plot the element, or draw the element, I should say. Um, so we'll create a routine for this, or a method, I should say. Draw elements. And we need the from point. We need the to point. We need the element itself. And we want the areas. Display the element. So we displayed the node previously. Now I want to connect it by drawing the element. And again, the idea of this is just to make sure that we actually have our geometry correct, that we can look at it visually. Um, so let's pop in another method here. This doesn't return anything, but rather just draws the element. So we'll define x1 as the from point, from point 0. We can say that y1 is equal to from point 1. Similarly, x2 is 2 point 0, and y, whoops, y2 is equal to 2 point 1. And then we want to plot, uh, actually create a plot, The x coordinates we'll just put in as a list. So it would be x1, x2, x1, x2, and then simply y1, y2. We'll change color just to emphasize it. The color will be, I'll pick green. Line style is just a solid line. Line width. Well, each of these elements are different areas, so we can emphasize it by changing the line width in accordance, and we'll say that's equal to areas of this particular element. So we passed all of that in, and the z-order of this, we're going to make 1. So the element should be behind the node and behind any of the annotations. And just because I want to emphasize it a bit, I'm going to take the areas and multiply it by 7. And I guess this was just through trial and error previously done. That's that. So what have I done? I've passed the from point, the to point, the areas of each element, and the element itself, meaning the element number. And I've used that to get the element area, and I've used that to determine the line width. The from and to points are used to know where to draw from and to, obviously. So let us continue. And I think it probably is going to be helpful just to put a few comments in here. This follows on from the previous video. That, um, what do we want to do? We want to find, find element mass and stiffness matrices. We've seen that in a previous video. We want to then rotate, find the rotated mass and stiffness element matrices. Uh, and then we want to change from element to global coordinates. And then finally what we're going to do is we're going to add those to the global matrices. So we say m plus equals, um, oh, let me hold off on that, come back to that. So let's add a bit of meat here now. Find the element mass and stiffness matrix. Well, let's get the properties first. What do we know about the length of the element? The length of the element can be found by using the norm, which we've imported up above. And it's the from and to coordinates, right? It's the norm of the from point. Um, excuse me. Y1, 
what I want to do up here that I didn't do is create the element vector. The element vector is just very simply defined as the two point minus the from point. It's the difference of the two coordinates that it connects. We'll define as the element vector. And then the length is equal to the norm of the element vector. That's easy enough. Um, rho, which is the density of the element, is equal to properties, uh, densities of the element. Similarly, the area of the element is equal to properties of areas and uh, quotations here, since I'm actually using the name of the key, which is density. Similarly, areas of the element. Uh, then the Young's modulus, which we'll just call E, is equal to property stiffnesses of the element. And just because I like making things neat and readable, I'm going to put some spaces here. Now that we have the properties, we can calculate these quantities that we've defined before called CM and CK. This is just following on the definition from the previous video. Cm is equal to rho, the density, times the area, times the length, divided by 6. Uh, Ck is equal to Ea over L, so E times area divided by length. And then finally, we can get the element matrices. This should be no surprise to you. NP array. We've seen this in a previous video, on a couple of previous videos. And I want to put in a... Let me just write this first. Okay, it's a list of lists, is how I define it. 2, 1, 1, 2. Remember, this is going to be multiplied by CM, but I'm going to do that at the end. In other words, I could put CM here, but I would suggest not doing it. Why? Because it actually makes debugging easier. When you've got whole integer numbers like that and you want to try to do some debugging, it makes it easier. I'm going to save you the debugging. I did it myself, but as a result, I'll multiply CM in at the end. All right, similarly for the K matrix, it's an umpire array. And it's a list of lists again. And in this case, it's uh, 1 minus 1, minus 1, 1. That's it. We now have the element matrices. So finding the rotated matrices, and this is now a little bit new, but follows on from the previous video. We first want to find tau, which is the rotation matrix. We'll call that tau, T-A-U. Um, and I guess the easiest way is to define another method to handle this, just to keep it neat. So we'll call it rotation matrix of element vector and the x and y axis. So I'm going to create a method called rotation matrix that takes the element vector takes the x-axis and y-axis, and fundamentally will determine the direction cosines, and from that construct the matrix. Well, why don't we do that? Up here, define rotation matrix. And really, this is about find the direction cosines. And... Um, I'm going to say the x projection is equal to, I'll define another method for this called direction cosine. And the direction cosine will take, it's going to take two vectors, right? Vec1 and Vec2. In this case, it's the element vector and the x-axis. 
And similarly for the y projection, I'm going to say that the y projection is the direction cosine of the element vector in the y axis. In other words, if I take my element vector and I project it onto the x axis, I'm able to get the direction cosine. Similarly for the y axis. So let's add this method up above. Uh, direction cosine. Oops. Vec1 and Vec2. Uh, and in this case, we're going to just, we can do it in one statement, actually. This is really just from the definition of what a cosine or, or, or what a dot product is. So if we take the dot product, which is np, numpy, dot product of vec1 and vec2, and we want to divide that by the magnitude, the product of the magnitudes of the vector. That's a mouthful. So I want to divide that by the product of the magnitude of the vectors. So it's norm of vec1 times norm of vec2. That's it. And what I'm going to return here is actually the matrix. So we want to take these x and y projections and put it into a NumPy array. And let me see, what is the easiest way of doing that? Um, again, that's a list of lists. And this just follows on from how we defined it in the previous video. It's the x projection, uh, let me not leave the space, y projection, 0, 0. And then in the second row, it's 0, 0, x projection, x axis, x projection, y projection. So again, what have I done? I've taken the element vector and my definition of x and y axis. In each case, I found the projection by determining what the direction cosine is, using this routine above. And then I'm returning an array, which if we look down here, we're calling tau. I'm returning this array and I'm storing it as tau. And that array is exactly what we defined in the previous video as being the transformation tau. Okay, so back down here. I'm going to define the rotated mass matrix as M sub R, rotated mass matrix, and that is equal to tau times, or excuse me, tau transpose times, meaning the dot product of, so dot, the original mass matrix, again dot, tau. And I'm going to do copy and paste for the stiffness matrix, where all we do is we replace the K with M. So now we have the rotated mass and stiffness matrix. All right. And now the final step is to change from element to global coordinates. Well, how do we do that? Again, we're following up from the previous video. Uh, we already have something called the degrees of freedom, the degrees of freedom for the element. We found that up above here. Okay. Remember, the degrees of freedom is just an array containing, it, it's, a, it's a vector basically, containing the degrees of freedom for the from node and the to node, the degrees of freedom for that element. In the previous video we discussed, well, first of all, we want to change this to an index. Why? Because the degrees of freedom might be 1, 2, 3, 4, but where they appear in the list, i.e. their index, would be 0, 1, 2, 3, because Python is zero-based indexing. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to create an index, which is degrees of freedom minus 1. And the real cool thing about NumPy arrays is if I define it this way, it's actually going to subtract 1 from each element. That's real easy. Then I want to define my matrix B. We're going to start off with zeros. Just I'm going to take it. Um, B is a 2 by 4 matrix. Did I say that correctly? So what we do is... Excuse me, it's not a 2 by 4. It's 4 by the number of degrees of freedom. Let me write that out. It will become a little bit clearer. 4 by the number of degrees of freedom. So first thing I do is I create a matrix B of the appropriate size, and I'm just filling it up with zeros. Number of degrees of freedom is actually 6 in this case. Um, 
we've got four rows and we've got six columns all containing zeros. And now what we need to do is we need to put ones in the position that correspond to the element degrees of freedom based on the global matrix. And again, if this is confusing, please go and have a look at the previous video. In fact, I'm going to put a link right here to it so that you can refresh. Now the way we do this is for i in range um, 4, since each element has 4 degrees of freedom. And then we're going to say b i comma index. So in position i, in, in row i, and in column whatever the index is, we want to make that a 1. Actually, I need another bracket around here. Okay, uh, hopefully that's not confusing, but oh, that is confusing because I didn't write it correctly. This should be index i. Okay, so i goes from zero to four, uh, zero to three in this case. We're saying in position or in row zero, one, two, three, and the appropriate column is whatever this index is at that location, we want to insert a 1. Might take you a little bit of thinking just to get that down, but that's how it works. And then we want to get the global rotated matrices. So we're going to take the rotated K and M matrix and expand it to the global size. How do we do that? We'll call it capital M now to denote that it's global, subrotated RG. And that is equal to B transpose. So we do B transpose and NumPy. We want to dot that with the rotated mass matrix, so M sub R. And we want to multiply or dot that with B. Okay, so it's B transpose times the rotated mass matrix times B. And completely analogous for the rotated global K matrix, except we replace our M's with K's. And then we have that. So the only thing left to do now is to add that to the global matrix. Remember, up here we defined a matrix, K and M, the global matrix just containing zeros. We did this in a previous and two previous videos. Um, and you should have the link in front of you if you want to go and look at that. But all we need to do now is add the element to the existing mass and global mass and stiffness matrix. How do we do that? Well, that's dead simple. M plus equals M rotated global. K plus equals K rotated global. Okay, and that's it as far as our mass and stiffness matrices go. I say that's it. It's actually quite a lot of work, but uh, now we're done. And uh, this should be pretty readable if you go back through it. Okay, so the only thing left to do in this routine is to find the global F matrix, or the F vector. Okay, um, That's reasonably easy because we've been given the forces in the global coordinate system. We don't have to convert anything, we just need to construct it. So, let's say, construct the force vector. And we start off by just defining f as a list. And then for f in forces.values, what is that doing? Let's just jump back to the top and have a look. Under setup, forces, force.values will return a list of each of these values. And what we want to do is we want to put each of those values we want to create a force vector that basically looks like 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, minus 200. That's what we're trying to do. So we'll say for f and forces dot value, f dot extend. And I mentioned before why we use extend and not update, because we want to flatten it. We want to extend it with f. And then finally, we just want to convert this into a NumPy array. So we'll say f equals NumPy array of f. Boom. So the last thing we need to do is just remove the restrained degrees of freedom. And then we're pretty much done with this. 
um, let's put a comment in here, remove the restrained degrees of freedom. And let's find out the indices. In fact, um, remove indices, I'll call it. And that's just a NumPy array. So I want to create an array of those, not the degrees of freedom, but the indexes, the indices of the degrees of freedom. In other words, what rows and what columns of the matrices do I need to delete? That's the easiest way of putting it. And what that is, is the degrees of freedom minus one. We saw that up above. So we'll take the restrained degrees of freedom, sorry, properties, restrained degrees of freedom, and we want to subtract one from each of those. So again, we take properties, the restrained degrees of freedom, we put that in a NumPy array, and as mentioned before, once it's in a NumPy array, if I subtract one, it will subtract it element by element. Um, then we'll proceed exactly like we did in the previous video where we showed this, uh, for i in 0, 1 since I want to do it for each of the axis 0 and axis 1, which are the rows and the columns, respectively. Uh, take the mass matrix, numpy delete. From the mass matrix, we want to delete um, whatever the remove indices are. And in this case, the axis equals i. Let me just say that again. For each of the axes, 0 and 1, we want to take the mass matrix and whatever the remove indexes, indices are, we want to just delete that row and that column. That's axis 0 and axis 1. And the way we get to the remove indices is we take the restrained degrees of freedom and we subtract 1 from them because we know each degree of freedom corresponds to one number less in terms of the row and columns in the matrix. Okay. And I'm going to copy and paste this for the K matrix. Since we want to do the exact same thing here, we just replace M with K. And then finally, we just need to delete the corresponding degrees of freedom, restrained degrees of freedom from the F matrix, or the F vector. So F delete, F removing the C. And that's it. This routine is now done, pending some, probably some typos that I'm going to need to debug. And that's the difficult part over with. Okay, so let's go back to our main method. We've done these two parts. This part, there's nothing to do. We've got our M and K matrix, uh, eigenvalues, eigenvectors. This method has already been provided for us. Same thing here. So the next thing that we need to do, well, this has been provided for us too, right? Because we know the K matrix, we know the F matrix. That's what we just finished up. Uh, we should be able to get the displacements. And now we've got to calculate the stresses in each element. So let's go up to this routine and put some meat into that. And I want to start off by pulling out some of the properties we need, uh, the X axis and the Y axis. Similarly, the y-axis is equal to properties y-axis. Um, I also want the elements. And I should probably have described it first, but let me just finish this, and then I'll come back and try to explain what it is we're trying to do and why we need this. Let's just space it out to make it a little bit more readable. Okay, so the idea is, is we want to find the stresses in each member. Since we have the displacements, we want to convert that displacement into the element coordinates. Why? Because we have the displacements and the global coordinates. So we want to convert those displacements into the element coordinates because we want to see 
what is the displacement or what is the strain really in each of these elements. From the strain we can then find the stresses because we have the Young's modulus E. Okay, so we start off by saying stresses, we'll just create a list, empty list. And then for element in elements, in fact, this is exactly what we did up above here, where we did get matrices. For each element, we want the from point, we want the to point. So I'm going to just copy and paste that. Right? We're going to take each element, we want to know the point for each element, and we want the element vector itself. So I'm just going to copy that, and I'm going to paste it in here. Okay, no surprises there. So I want to cycle through each element. I want to take the actual coordinates of the from and the to node of each element and the degrees of freedom for that element. I then want to create the element vector by subtracting the from point from the to point. Um, I then need to calculate the rotation matrix. In fact, we did this before as well. here under get matrices I want to get the rotation matrix right it's just tau is the rotation matrix of the element vector the x and y axes call that tau again and then I want the global displacement. And I'm going to just create an array to define that. Let's do this uh, NumPy array. And what is that? Well, in this case, it's since we know that the from coordinates in each case are fixed. Probably not the best way of doing this, but it will work this way. So what have I done? I've created a, an array called global displacements. I've recognized that for each of the elements in this case, because they're restrained, these coordinates are going to be 0, and then x0 and x1. And x0 is fed in here. x1, I should say, and x0. And where do we get that? x is found by the static displacement here. All right, so to continue, we've created a, an array or a vector called global displacements. And now I'm going to find the nodal displacements by taking tau, our rotation matrix, and multiplying it or dotting it with the global displacements. So what have I done? I've taken this global displacement vector, and I've rotated it according to our definition of the rotation from the previous video. In this case, just by pre-multiplying it by tau, multiplying in the dot product sense. So now what I have is I have the element displacements. Clearly, the from node is not going to displace at all because we've got zeros here, and we know that from the, the original problem. Now we can calculate the strains and stresses. Well, how do we do that? Well, we take our definition of strain. Strain is simply... Q1. Remember that this Q is, a, is going to be a 2 by 1 vector. Okay? We're taking this 4 vector, 4 by 1 vector, 4 by 1 matrix, and when we multiply it by tau, it converts it into 2 by 1. Does this make sense? Well, yes, it does, because the element only has two different displacements, one at each node, because we're now looking at just the axial displacements. Right? It's, it, the element, after all, is a one degree a one-dimensional problem, I should say. It's a one-dimensional element. So the strain can be found as taking Q, Q1 minus Q0 and dividing it by the length. Well, how did we find the length before? That's the norm of the element vector. Okay. Stress is equal to the strain times the Young's modulus. So it's E of this particular element 
Remember that E up above here actually gives us a dictionary. The stiffness is, is a dictionary. So to, uh, to pick out the correct one, we take E for that element, and we multiply that by the strain. That's pretty straightforward. Then the last thing that we want to do is we want to add it to our stresses here. We've got a stresses list, and for each element we want to add it to the list. Uh, so in this case we can use the append instead of extend. Stress. And then finally we already have our return statement where we're going to return the stresses. Okay, so get stresses is now done. What did we do? We found the stress in each member by finding the rotation matrix, rotating the global displacement into the element coordinate system, finding the axial displacements. From those, we can calculate the strain. The strains give us the stresses. We put all the stresses into a list, and we return it. Boom, that's done. So now we're down to just showing the results. We're here. And this is just a question of what do we want to print out. Um, we'd like to print the nodal displacements. Nodal displacements. Um, and that's x, of course. We'd like to also print the stresses. And those are just the stresses. We would like to print out, oh, uh, let's say the frequencies. Oops. Print the free frequencies. We'd like to print out the magnitude, perhaps, of the displacement. So we've got the displacement in the x and the y direction, but what is the total displacement? when I pull down by 200 uh, pounds, uh, with a force of 200 pounds, I should say. So we'll call this the displacement magnitude. And that would just be the norm, in this case, of x. Um, the norm of x. And then finally, just leave another line. Well, why don't we round this, since the norm of x is going to have a bunch of decimal places, why don't we just round this to, say, five decimal places? All right, and just like that, we are done. All that remains, let me just collapse some of this, is to run it and probably require a little bit of debugging. We'll do that in a second. But, um, these are our various functions or methods we defined. The main routine of the problem looks fairly straightforward since all the meat and potatoes is in these methods. Just want to clean this up a little bit so we can fit most of it on one page. And now all we need to do is to run it and or debug it.